following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning. It, is, it is both Trinity Sunday and Father's Day. And um, I can't honestly tell you if it falls that way every year in the church calendar. Um, but I realized the first Sunday of June was Ascension Sunday when Matthew told us that the power of the risen Lord is with us. Last Sunday was Pentecost, when we learned about the power of the Holy Spirit, even in our pain and our lamentation. And this morning on Father's Day, we are celebrating God the Father, as well as God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus had explained to his disciples that after he ascended to the Father, together they would send the Spirit to be a helper and advocate. This Spirit is the Spirit of truth who helps us remember Jesus' teachings and guides us into all truth. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Well, Southern California is one of the nation's largest horse racing centers thanks to the climate where horses can be run year-round. San Luis Rey, in particular, serves as a regional hub to trainers. So when wildfires swept through that area in 2017, there were a lot of horse barns that caught fire, and unfortunately, dozens of horses that died. Well, now horses naturally panic during a fire, and even if they are freed from their stalls, they do not always run for freedom or understand how to escape the flames. It is best if someone leads them to safety. It is best if they have on a halter and you attach a lead, if they trust you enough that you can lead them away from the fire. Horses are, of course, very large and very strong, they generally weigh over 1,400 pounds, so you can't really force them to go where they don't want to go. You can't pick them up and carry them somewhere. I used to have a small dog, and that was very handy to be able to just snatch her up at times of crisis and just carry her where I needed her to go, but you cannot do that with a horse. You have to convince it to trust you to be led to a safe place. Well, those who are led by the Spirit, we people who cho have chosen to listen to the Spirit of God. Now, God is powerful enough that he could force us to do what he knows is in our best interests. It is his decision to give us the freedom to choose for ourselves. He does not want slaves. He does not want robots. He wants children. He wants sons and he wants daughters. And in order to get that, he has to give us the freedom to choose whether we will be led by the Spirit or not. Well, now Jesus spoke far more often about sheep and shepherds than he did about horses. I know horses fairly well. But when Jesus spoke to his followers, he would speak as follows. And this is from the book of John, chapter 10. Jesus said, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep 
that do not belong to this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Well, now, when you are rescuing horses from a fire, it's not enough to lead them away from their stall and simply let them go, because that stall was their home. That was where they were fed. That was where they were cared for. They felt safe there. They felt protected there. And they cannot comprehend that it's no longer a safe place. So in their fear, they are likely to fall back into the safe, comfortable place that they know because of their animal instincts. And Paul is reminding us that because we have received God's spirit, we don't any longer have a spirit of slavery. We should not fall back in fear. We have been adopted by God. Well, now, I worried a little bit whether I was being rather dramatic by talking about horses escaping from a fire. And then I remembered what Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. What has been built on the foundation survives. The builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Well, now Paul also talked in other letters about the concept of adoption and about the fact that we have been adopted by God himself. <clears throat> so let me read to you from Galatians how he described it there. But now to continue. The son who will receive his father's property is treated just like a slave while he is young, even though he really owns everything. While he is young, there are men who take care of him and manage his affairs until the time set by his father. In the same way, we too were slaves of the ruling spirits of the universe before we reached spiritual maturity. But when the right time finally came, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might become God's children. To show that you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. <coughs> the spirit who cries out, Father, my Father. So then you are no longer a slave, but a child. And since you are his child, God will give you all that he has for his children. Now, I wondered whether the word adoption might mean something different to Paul. And so I looked up the Roman laws because he was speaking to the Romans. This, the letter to the Romans is where he talks about adoption. And to me, the laws in ancient Rome were pr 
pretty much the opposite of ours. When a child was born biologically, your parents had the option of disowning you, okay? They had no requirement to raise you. Um, if they decided that you were not going to be a fit member of the family, that was it. You were out of the family. The opposite was true if you were adopted. If you were adopted, they could never disown you, okay? They had chosen you, they had selected you, and by law, no matter how much you disappointed them, that was it. You were permanently a part of the family. It was actually the most powerful families, the most wealthy families in Rome that used adoption. Now, infant mortality rates were very high, but it was also very expensive to raise sons and daughters. And obviously, they couldn't know, you know, if they had several children, they couldn't know if they were going to end up with daughters or with sons. A daughter had to be given a dowry, and a son had to be given an expensive education. So one family might end up with multiple sons, and another wealthy family might have no sons. So it was very common practice. It also created bonds between the families. They viewed it um, almost as a marriage covenant. It was a way of joining together two wealthy families. It was usually the oldest son in the family that was being adopted out. So it was the boy who, who would have inherited from his biological father who was actually adopted into another wealthy and powerful family. The other important thing to understand is that as soon as that boy was adopted, and it was always sons because they were the only ones who could inherit, um, as soon as he was adopted into that other family, he immediately became a joint owner with the father who had adopted him. So the big expensive house that they were living in, as soon as that boy was adopted, that was also his house permanently. Everything that the father owned became the possession of that adopted son. And again, this is different from the way they treated their biological children. So when Paul tells us that we have been adopted by God, he is telling us, first of all, that it is a permanent relationship, that God will never disown us. Once we are adopted, that's it. It is permanent for all eternity. Paul is also telling us that everything that God has, because of our connection with Jesus, everything belonging to God is ours also. When I thought about that idea, I remembered the story of Jesus with some of his disciples in the boat when the storm came up and Jesus was asleep and wind and waves and the disciples were freaking out. They're hysterical. Oh my gosh, we're going to die. We're going to die. And they wake up Jesus and I can just imagine he's kind of looking at them. It's like, I chose you, God chose you, you know, he's not going to let you die in his lake, his wind and waves. Um, let's just ask the Father who controls the wind and the waves, and he will take care of this situation for you. And as soon as Jesus prayed, then the waves calmed, the winds calmed. So this is a reminder by Paul that we can call on our Father, that God considers that everything belonging to him is also belonging to us, and that it is permanent, it is for all eternity. Now, I would like to leave it there, but the scripture passage does end with the idea that we are joint heirs with Christ if, in fact, we suffer with him 
so that we may also be glorified with him. We have to die to our human nature so that we don't fall back into slavery to sin, so that we don't fall back into fear, and then we are resurrected in the spirit. Matthew told us last Sunday that God empowers us in our pain and lamentation. It is through Christ and the Spirit that God accomplishes this. But we have to choose to be led by the Spirit in order for God to empower us. Now, I looked in the United Methodist Book of Worship. I was hoping that there was actually a service for um, adoption, for adoptive parents, and I was going to actually have us do part of that service. Um, There isn't any such thing, but there is a Westminster Confession that was written, I believe, in 1646 in England, and of course, the Methodist Church came out of the Church of England. This is a confession that today is more often used by the Church of Scotland or Presbyterian churches, but it carefully defines those who receive the grace of adoption. So I would like to read that to you now. It defines those who receive the grace of adoption as those who enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God, have his name put upon them, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, are chastened by him, as by a father, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption, and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. So on this Father's Day, won't you give your heavenly Father the gift that he most wants from you? Won't you choose to be led by his Spirit? He has selected you for adoption. He's chosen you to be his beloved child. He knows you, and he loves you, and he wants you to call him Abba, Daddy. Please say yes and give him your heart. We read the story of honor and glory and praise the name of Christ. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.